Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back. And you know what it means when there's a tea time on Monday. That means it's a surprise tea time or a special tea time or a rescheduled tea time because that's how Miss Liz works. But the original day for tea time is on Thursday at seven at 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So today I have the incredible Claudio Resinal Res, in, in the house, and we're going to be talking baseball scouting and his new book. The lead from the heart up, not from the neck up. So we're going to be talking about that and all the incredible stuff that this man has done. Uh, but before we get started on that, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. We're going to get you to ring that little doorbell so that you can check out these tea times at any time in the morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, check out the replays. Leave your feedback. Leave your comments. And if you have a suggestion for any of the tea times, please let me know. So let's get started with the disclaimer bio and then let me get Claudio in here and we're going to spill a different type of tea today. Today we're serving you a top tea. That means tough, overcome, persistence. That's right. We serve different types of teas in this house. We serve real life stories and words. So let's get started with the disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live Show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, at my email at bookymissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and will see you at a later show at a later date and time. Now, a little bit about my incredible guest who's sitting in the back room, and we're going to serve you a good, strong cup of tea today, uh, is Claudio Resinal. Uh, Claudio is a general manager and professional baseball scout with the Global Scouting Bureau and the head baseball coach at Kent. Carnerish Mellon University, I hope I'm saying that right, with a coaching career that began in 1983. Claudio has led teams to incredible successes, including two consecutive co conference championships at the CMU in 2015 and 2016. He is also the all-time leader in baseball wins at CMU. Beyond his coaching achievements, Claudio is a professional hitting instructor, hosts multiple sport-related shows, and has a rich background in sports media, including writing for various publications. His passion extends from beyond baseball, as he has ventured into boxing, MMA promotions, and motivational speaking. Let me get Claudio on here, and let's still spill a good cup of tea together. Welcome, Claudio. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to doing this for quite a while. Thank you. Well, I am really honored because I love baseball. Uh, you know, it is something that I grew up watching and playing as well. And it was one of my sport favorite sports in school as well. So I'm honored to have you here, Claudio. Uh, so let's get honest. so let's get started with who who are you as a little guy and who are you now as a grown man? You know what? I tell the story all the time, and I think my wife's tired of hearing it, but um, August 19th, 1973, I was eight years old, and I went to my very first pirate game. Um, my parents were from Italy, so they were boxing fans and soccer fans. But my uncle used to work at Three River Stadium, which is where the Pirates and the Steelers used to play. So um, I went to my first game, and I saw this big, beautiful building called Three River Stadium. And to this day, I remember walking through those beautiful wooden doors, that scent, 
going up the elevator. And as soon as the elevator opened up, I remember to my right, there was a Roberto Clemente uh, picture in color for him kneeling in Three River Stadium on the field. Then I walked through the hallways and, and I saw all these athletes. I didn't even know who they were. I just saw them. There was a guy named Babe Ruth and, and uh, former Steelers and Pirates and everything like that. The only person I knew who it was was Clemente. And I just was quiet, didn't say a word. Then my uncle took me down to the locker rooms and I saw these big guys in this bright white uniform that said Pirates on it. And again, they were saying hello to me and joking with me and I knew who they were. And I snuck out onto the field. This was about 1030 in the morning. And the only people that were on the field were the ground crew and me. And I, I seen all these colorful seats, big, beautiful scoreboard, 58,000 seat uh, or, you know, stadium. And I just knew that I loved where I was. It was a very special feeling that I can, again, tell you about to this day. And this is before the game even started. Then I uh, watched the game. Then I remember coming home and uh, my dad, and I live in the same house I grew up in. So about maybe 10 feet from where I'm sitting right now, I walked in and, and my dad said, did you have a good time? I said, I did, but I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. And I, he said, what's that? I said, I want to be a professional baseball. That's all I said. And he very simply said, uh, if that's what you want to do, me and your mother will do everything we can to give you every opportunity in the world to make your dreams come true. He gave me a hug and a kiss. My mom said, yeah, whatever we can do. Uh, she said it in Italian, of course. Uh, she, whatever we can do to help you, you know, we'll be there. And, and you know, I always say, um, there's if you ever see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know, he didn't get there alone. So wherever it is I'm at in my life, without my parents' love and support, and now my wife and daughter, um, but, you know, that start with my parents, it would have never happened. And they didn't question me. They, they were always there uh, through the ups and the downs, the wins and the losses. And uh, I'm forever, ever, ever grateful to that. Well, that's one thing that really inspired me when I did my homework on you, Claudio, was the, the motivation, right? The failures and the wins, because we don't talk about that a lot in life, right? Uh, and to get where you were, there had to have been a lot of falls, right? To get right back up. But that's what baseball is all about, right? Is sliding in, coming into that home base and, you know, getting roughed up a bit. So, uh Tell us a little bit about that scent as a little boy, because you talked about the scent walking into the stadium and you smelled that. What what, what smell is that? Well, I I can smell it to this day once in a while, but to describe it, it was just a clean scent of like a new office because the stadium was only really three years old at the time, two and a half years old. And um, it was just magical is the best way to put it. Uh, and it was just meant, you know, I always say I left the house that day. Uh, regular eight-year-old kid thinking about Batman and Iron Man and all that. And I came back with a dream in my heart. And, and it wasn't easy. I mean, you know, I first of all, I didn't know if I had any talent in the sport or not. Um, thank God I did. Um, and, and I you know, had a nice high school career and all that kind of stuff, summer league career. And of course, I went into coaching and scouting, and I'm sure we'll get into that. But there were a lot of ups and downs. Um, yeah. You know, some of the ups were, of course, getting the opportunities, the jobs, the championships, the awards, and stuff like that. But then the downs were the rejections. You know, I had hundreds of rejections from from teams uh, over the years, and I do mean hundreds. Um, and then. Um, if they, and that, and that includes, that's not including the ones that didn't write me back, which were rejections. Uh, my mom, and then people who I cared for very much, just constantly telling me that it wasn't going to happen. Time to grow up, be a man, get a real job. It's a pipe dream. You're Buffalo and everybody, including yourself. You're going to be a failure. You're going to be a loser. You know, people are going to laugh at you. And those, those words stuck with me really to this day, to be honest with you. And even harder was my mom, who I adored my mom, and she adored me. Uh, she passed away at age 48, uh, October 8th, 1988. And then my dad, my dad at least got to see me, uh, you know, make the dream come true. I think my mom did too, but uh, my dad was, you know, present and um, his passing was hard. But my mom's you know, when she passed on October 8th, 1988, 
Um, I'll never forget. I, I was 23 and I was, I uh, just got off of my first head coaching job at my old high school. And I had a very successful season, had a great group of guys, but, um, I was at the casket and I remember just looking at my mom and I always say it's the first time that I ever kissed her that she didn't kiss me back. And um, I was just devastated of her passing. And I remember walking into the funeral home and this one uh, relative said to me, and he was always against me. He said, now it's really time to grow up and quit baseball and be a man. Now, what did that have to do with anything at that particular moment? I don't know. But I remember going to the casket and just kneeling there and and my dad came over and he had these thick hands and he said he put his hand on my hand and he said i know what you're thinking and you can't he knew that i was i could care less about baseball and to be honest with you liz i was just going to move on um and uh I, i just had no heart for it anymore and um he said but you promised your mom that you wouldn't give up she didn't give up her fight You promised her that you would accomplish this. So you have to keep fighting. You have to keep going after your dream, our dream. And I'm telling you, as soon as he said that, you know, as corny as it sounds, and I'm just telling you what happened, you know, you you hear the Rocky theme, you know, and and I grabbed my mom's hand and I said, Ma, you didn't quit. I won't either. And uh, and I didn't. And it took, you know, several years later, uh, another, what, 13 years later, something like that. But, you know, it finally did happen. But, you know, there's there's ups and downs. That's one thing that we all have in common is adversity. And really, it, it's how you deal with it. And and I wanted to quit. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, no, I fought through. I, I didn't want to quit. Yeah, I, I wanted to quit. There were a few times I wanted to quit. But what would that have done? Um, so, I, you know, you, you fall down six times, you rise seven, and you dust yourself off, and you, you keep plowing along. And, and that's what I did. And I... I used my worst enemies, the people who were against me, the rejections, to be my best ally. Um, and I used my and, and I and my mom mo- was a motivation. My dad was a motivation. And then later on, when the dream came true, I was 36. I was married and I had a baby on the way. Uh, so that was motivation to not quit as well. But um, and, and thank God things uh, went the way they did. You know, any story that has any form of adversity has struggles, right? And and the failures are what are stepping stones, right? And that's what encourages us to keep moving because everyone is just throwing these stones at us and we're just like, oh, do we stay down or do we get back up, you know? Yeah, that's that's very Um, true. And that's one thing about my life as well is, you know, give me that stone. I'm going to step up. I'm going to take another step closer to what you say I can't do, uh, you know, uh, Claudio, I want to get into the childhood dream, right? Because there's so many children out here that listen to tea time with Miss Liz and they're like, well, Miss Liz, how do these dreams happen? How do these people get to where they are? Well, it's not an overnight success guys. It's hard work. So I want you to share that with my younger viewers and listeners out there on the childhood dream on how to push through it. You know, I was asked to do a speech in January to a high school. And they said, if you can box your career slash slash life into a 50 minute speech, that'd be great. So I'm, I was walking and right in front of my old junior high. This hit me, the, the, the word top, T-O-P-P. And I had to be tough. I had to overcome. I had to be persistent. And I prayed a lot. And, that, and now, you know, however, whoever people pray to, that's certainly you know, uh, up to them, of course, whatever's in their heart. But for me, I had to be tough. I had to overcome and I had to be persistent. Tough in the sense of uh, you had to be tough when you got all the rejections, you know, because just because you're good in your little hometown, other people could care less. You know, there's a lot of people like you. And I kept getting, as you said, stones thrown at me. And I had to be tough. I had to overcome my mom's passing. I had to overcome the rejections. I had to overcome that everybody was getting these jobs and I was still struggling. I had to be persistent and keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. But the the other thing too, besides, you know, working hard and being persistent, being tough and overcoming is I was very, very focused. I was not going to let anything stop me. I, as, as cliche as that is, and so that's easy to say, easy to say, but tough to do, but I did do it. 
And you know what? I look back on it and I say, wow, did I really do that? Did I really say those things? Did I really work that hard? And I did. And it took some nerve to, to contact professional teams over and over and over again um, to call teams. And, and, and um, so I have a couple stories, too, that I'd love to share with you about how things can happen. But before I do share those uh, and, and to your young audience, um, my wife and I were going to go see a friend of mine who's a Hall of Fame boxer, Vinny Pazienza. We're going to go to Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut. So I wanted some reading material. So I got something called the Sporting News. There was a little block, tiny block, that were that, that this company, the Global Scouting Bureau, was uh, connecting players to Europe. So I said, well, I can read, write, and speak Italian. Maybe I'll contact this company and see if I could be a liaison of some sort, something, you know? So um, to stop there, I was climbing the ladder. Everybody thought pretty quick. I didn't think it was quick, but everybody thought it was quick. You said overnight sensation. Yeah, I, I, I've heard that, but it wasn't overnight and it wasn't sensational. But um, I, was, I got to division one in college as an assistant coach. Then I dropped out of sight a few years. Then my next job was at a, I, I loved the job, but it was a very small Catholic high school that was very small. And I was making $800 a year. That's it. So um, I contacted this company in November of 99. And I kept contacting them and contacting them two, three times a month, two, three times a month. Then in January of 2001, I got the job that I have now. And there's a story with that, too, if you want to hear it later. But then I got the job that I have now uh, with the Global Scouting Bureau. But I was persistent. You know, I, I believed in myself and I kept putting it out there. Now, and this is for, for the kids out there who are listening. I said August 19th. There's two stories. August 19th, 1973. I was eight years old. Uh, pitching that day for the Pirates was a guy named Jim Rooker. Jim and I have become very good friends to this day. We've played many celebrity golf tournaments together, and uh, Jim has done some scouting for our company. The first baseman's name was Al Oliver. Al and I are friends. Al and I were inducted into the same Hall of Fame a few years ago. The second baseman's name was Rennie Stennett. Rennie and I became friends. Rennie invited me as his guest to the 1979 Pirate Reunion, which was... I. Magical. The left fielder's name was Willie Stargell, and I won a Willie Stargell Lifetime Achievement Award. The opposing pitcher that day was a guy named Juan Marichal, Hall of Famer. I signed his nephew to a pro contract. Now, if you would have told me back then, at age eight years old, eight eight year old Claudio, come here. These things are going to happen to you. You're going to know this guy, and this guy's going to invite you here, and you're going to be friends with this guy. You're going to say, "Ah, you're crazy," but it did happen. It did happen. Then the final story on this, it was July of 99. I was by myself watching the 1999 All-Star Game. My wife was somewhere. She was working. My dad was downstairs. He lived with us. We lived together. And they had the 1999 Major League Baseball All-Star Game from Fenway Park in Boston. Now, at the time, I was a Quigley Catholic High School making $800 a year. So as I'm watching this great event, they're honoring the day's all-star, Mike Piazza, Nomar Garcia Parra, Tony Gwynn, all those, Mark McGuire, all those guys on the field in Boston. Then they were honoring the 50 greatest players of all time. Pete Rose, Johnny Bench, Jim Palmer, Tom Seaver, all these guys that I, Reggie Jackson, all these guys I grew up watching. And I start getting emotional. I said, oh man, you know, my childhood heroes. Then they opened up the center field wall and again, this is in Boston. And who comes out? Ted Williams in a golf cart. And he comes out and he doffs his cap and the place erupts. Okay. And again, this is January of uh, July of 99. And I got real emotional. I said, man, this is why I love this game. The present players, the past players, guys I grew up watching and idolizing. Oh, this is great. But like that, I got very, very depressed. I said, I'm about as far away from my dream as you can possibly get. $800 a year, you know, at a very small high school. I'm not climbing forward. I'm falling back. Got very depressed. 
fast forward to 2001. Remember, I got the job in January 2001. Well, I signed. Oh, and, and at that game, all the players converged, all the great players. And who was sitting behind Ted Williams? Juan Marichal, again, who I signed his nephew to a pro contract. John Henry Williams, Ted Williams' son. I signed him to a pro contract. Okay. And where were the Major League Baseball winter meetings that year? One of the play, one of the stops was in Boston at Fenway Park. So if you had told me two year rewind, two year, a couple years back when I was very depressed, don't get depressed, Claudio. You're going to be in that stadium for the Major League Baseball winter meetings. You're going to sign that young man in that golf cart, John Henry Williams. You're going to sign Juan Marichal's nephew to a pro contract. I said, you're crazy. But those things did happen. So I tell kids, there's nothing special about me other than I was tough. I had to overcome and I was persistent and I prayed. But those things did happen for me. And they can happen for you too. And, and, uh, and I firmly believe that if you really put everything you have. Now, again, I originally wanted to play. That didn't work out. But I got that three-letter word pro next to my name as a scout. After I got the job as a scout, I was offered pro coaching opportunities, which I turned down. But it did eventually happen. And it can happen for anyone out there uh, if they're good at what they do and if you work hard and you're persistent. Well, and, and that's the thing, right, Claudio? is like you were depressed for two years prior, and then all of a sudden all these things happen, right? And that's how life is. It's a roller coaster. You know, you go up, you go down, you slide in, you slide out. You know, you, you know, you just never know where life is going to take you. And had somebody told me that I would be interviewing you, you know, in season five, I would, I would say the same thing. You guys are crazy. Like, what, what do you guys think? Like, you know, uh, I'm just a lady that serves tea, but I'm serving top tea today with, with, with you, Claudio. And I really wanted you on my platform because you, you do have an inspiring story and you do have that voice that can encourage people to keep going. You know, in today's world, we have so many stones that are being thrown at us to just fall down and stay down, you know, and we need stories like yours to come to the table and say, you know what, get up, be that top person, you know, be tough, overcome, be persistent and keep trying. And I love that you gave me the top tea because, you know, I love different types of tea. And that's that's an amazing tea out there. We have a couple of questions that are coming in that I want to get to you. Um, so people are asking what baseball scouting is. So for the individuals out there that don't know what it is, could you sh share a little bit about that? That's a great question. And it's changed. And forgive me if there's any scouts out there listening. It has not changed for the better. I've been pretty vocal. I'll be 60 in October. I, I was really lucky to grow up when I did in all sports, but especially baseball. Now, no offense to anybody. Maybe I should have a disclaimer like you had. But <laughs> <laughs> when I was growing up, I learned from really some excellent baseball people. And scouting is what it is. You, you, you're a talent scout. Does this player have the talent? Does he have the arm? Does he have the speed? Uh, they call it the five tools. Does he have the arm? He have the speed, glove, power, hit for average. Okay, those five things. When I was coming up, you had a 20 to 80 Major League Baseball rating scale. So, Liz, if I tell you, let's stop there. If I tell you, uh, Liz, it's, it's hot here in Pittsburgh today. Your next question probably be, would be, how hot? And if I told you it's really hot, okay, you still don't know how hot it is. But, but if I tell you it's 85, now you know it's 85 degrees. In scouting, you had the 20 to 80 Major League Baseball rating scale. So if I told you that 50 is the Major League average for an arm, let's say, but I said this particular player has a 55, he has a little bit above Major League average arm. Okay. But, it, but nowadays, what they tell you is he's a plus. He's a plus plus. Well, what is a plus? It's like saying it's hot. How hot? Pretty hot. Give me, narrow it down. And the other thing that I personally think that has ruined the game is the analytics. Baseball is the number one statistics sport. When you talk about analytics, you hear, you know, how fast the bat came off the ball and all this crazy. Look, 
the guy's hitting 210. Why is he hitting 210? A lot of them can't tell you why he's hitting 210, but they can tell you he's hitting 210. Well, hell, anybody can see that. It's just changed. What they're looking for has changed. Me personally, to answer the original question, I learned a long time ago, what can you hang your hat on a baseball player? Is he a home run hitter? Is he hit for an average? Is he a great fielder? Does he do a little bit of everything? Is he a three-tool player, four-tool player, whatever? And what I try to do is paint a picture of that player that I'm evaluating to a scouting director. Their wants have changed. Their interests have changed as far as what they want to hear. They may not want to hear that he's he's doing something wrong, that's, which is preventing him from me being a better player, and or they may not want to hear what he's doing well to make him a better hitter. They just want to hear, you know, he's got an exit velo of 103. He throws 102. You know, I want to paint a picture of that hitter so you, the scouting director, know what he he can do. So basically what I like to do in our company, even though our company is adjusting to the new analytics, if a player is good, I want to describe why he is good, how he can be better, and maybe some things he needs to work on. And or if a player is not good, why he, I don't think he can go to the next level. And a lot of it for me is a gut instinct. And I think I'm very good at it, um, especially when it comes to seeing hitting a hitter's hole, what pitches he can hit, he can hit, how he can be better. Uh, I, I feel I'm very, very, very good at that. But basically, you're trying to paint a picture of that player to another person. Uh, who hopefully you can get some interest for that player to that uh, front office uh, professional baseball uh, scouting director. I hope I answered that okay. No, that's good. And the next question we have is what age range is uh, our scouters looking for? Scouts usually uh, high school. Uh, um, me personally, I, I like the player who's a little bit older because he's been away from home. He's a little bit older, a little more mature mentally and physically more important mentally. But 17 years old, they may dabble and look. They won't talk, but they may look at a junior just to follow him. And the same thing of a 17-year-old, because a lot of high school kids do get drafted. A lot of them do. But for me, I like the college kid and older. The next question we have is, how do you find the scouts? Do you go to uh, high school uh, baseball games, college games? How do you find these people, Claudio? Yes. You, you know, you go to high school games, you go to college games, you get referrals. Um, you know, you hear of a player over and over again, you go check them out. Uh, our, our company used to run tr uh, trial camps throughout the country. And we would promote, that would be my job to find a field, promote, evaluate, scout, try to send the player to the next level. And there's so many levels now. Of course, there's major league organizations and their, and their minor league teams, affiliates. There's independent league teams, which are not affiliated with the major league teams, but they are still professional. Then there's tons of opportunity overseas. And our company, the Global Scouting Bureau, has assisted in well over 2,500 players and signing all over the world. But we run tryout camps. And um, that model has kind of slowed up a little bit, but we have people contacting us. We have people referring referring players to us. Uh, we can give them a stamp and then try to promote them, try to get them signed. We'll have a stable of players uh, in, in our roster. Our, yeah, a bunch of names on our roster uh, slash stable, and we try to get them signed. And that's, uh, you know, we try to assist these players in, in getting out there. Sometimes they may get cut from a major league organization. And we'll try to, depending on what age they are, let's say they're 33 years old and, and they're pretty much done with the major league baseball uh, lane, so to speak. We'll try to send them to Taiwan or, or you know, again, overseas market. Uh, so there's different opportunities where they can still make a nice, nice living. So Claudio, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Global Scouting Bureau? Well, first I have to say the owner of the company, James Gamble, gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. Matter of fact, I did an interview with him, uh, I think it was last year, year and a half ago, and I couldn't finish it because I, he's become more than 
somebody who hired me more than a boss. You know, he's become a, a family member to me. And uh, he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. And so many things branched out from that opportunity, including Carnegie Mellon University. But um, uh, we, again, we, we uh, I would say that we're the number one independent scouting company out there. Uh, we deal with major league organizations, independent teams, as I said, overseas, have sent players to Italy, Germany, uh, Holland, you name it, uh, Venezuela, Colombia, um, all over the country, and independents, and again, major league organizations. And we've really been a great tool for players who maybe didn't get a look or didn't have a shot or an opportunity um, to, to get looked at. Well, we've given them that opportunity. Not to just get looked at, but to actually play. And um, you know, James always said he likes to be Santa Claus, and he was certainly Santa Claus for me, and he's been Santa Claus for many, many people. And I'll also say this, and maybe this is an opinion, but I don't think it is. I don't know of anybody who knows the the infrastructure of the game, the minutia of the signing players and all that kind of stuff more than James. And I've learned so much from him. Um, but uh, I, I think our company is is a is a helpful big time company. I really do, and it all starts with him. Well, and thank you for all that information and all these amazing names that you're throwing out there. You know, for all of my athlete sports fans out there that are listening to Tea Time, you know, uh, reach out to Claudio and and check him out. Uh, you know, uh, this is what we do on Tea Time: is we connect people, right? We connect you to my guest and that as well. So Claudio, I want to get into a little bit about the MMA and then you're also doing some boxing and all that good stuff. So what got you from baseball to MMA to boxing to motivational speaker? You're, you're doing it all. Yeah, I try to. Well, the MMA thing, that'll be a quick topic. Uh, I was um, a big boxing fan because as I said, from the outset, my parents were huge boxing fans. So I was a boxing fan from, you know, little, little kid. All I heard around this house was Rocky Marciano, Rocky Graziano. We used to walk, watch uh, Muhammad Ali fight and Foreman and all those guys. And I just happened to become very good friends with a few boxers. I mentioned Vinny Pazienza. I mentioned someone who your husband from his neighborhood, Donnie Lalon from Kitchener, Canada, uh, former champion, Ray Boom Boom Mancini, uh, Jerry Cooney, uh, just wonderful, wonderful people. Forget about their Hall of Fame careers, just wonderful people. But uh, the MMA thing, me and um, two others decided to start an MMA company. And I'll put it to you, it's a very difficult business um, promoting boxing or MMA, especially if you don't have a marquee name. Like those guys I mentioned, they were automatic sellouts. As soon as you mentioned Cooney, Lalonde, Pazienza, Mancini, sellouts everywhere they've been. But when you're just starting out, um, I'll put it to you this way. I took more of a beating financially than the fighters did that day. And I sold my piece back right at the end of the night. I said, I'm not going to take a beating like this financially. I just can't. But it was an experience. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say it was a good experience, but it was an experience. But the boxing, um, uh, that was one of my dreams when I was a kid, to have a boxing show. And uh, I was so fortunate to become good friends, uh, again, to me, family members, with a guy named Luther Dupree Jr. and Smoking Jim Frazier. Uh, they gave me my shot on TV. So I said, they're boxing fans. They know boxing. I said, why don't we do a show? So it started off as a show called Ring Talk, but then we went national. We got picked up by Vive Television Network, V-I-V-E Television Network. So now we're it's a global net, uh, show. And the show is called The Boxing Authorities, with Luther Bree Jr. and Smoke and Jim Frazier. And I mean this, and I can honestly look right in the camera, just like I can look in the camera and tell you that I'm extremely confident in myself when I talk about hitting and, and the do's and don'ts. I'm extremely confident and say this is boxing's best TV show. Not putting anybody else down, but this is a great show. And it just like this interview is flying by. That show. After every single show, we said, man, that show flew by. And we talk about today's boxing, the past boxing. We have great guests on. We have uh, different segments. 
And it's, I, I say this, and you're not old enough. Most people aren't old enough to remember Carol Burnett. Uh, that she had a, um, what the heck they call it, uh, variety show, which you had song and dance, skits, guests. That's our show. I, I, my idea was that the concept was let's have a boxing variety show, not just this guy threw a left, that guy threw a right. He got knocked down. He got up. Oh, those are boring. We add a lot of spice to it, okay? And and I always say it's 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 the boxing authorities uh, ton of information and uh, entertaining, and it is it's informative and entertaining, and um, love doing that show. So that's how I got in that. As far as the speaking is concerned, I, I've been fortunate to be friends with a lot of athletes, coaches, former athletes. Jim Valvano, the guy who you see on ESPN, the Never Give Up, the Jimmy V Cancer Fund, was a friend of mine and had a ton of impact in my life. Jimmy used to say his favorite word in the English dictionary was the word impact. So I remember when I was in eighth grade, there was a speaker come to the, uh, to the school. And he wasn't very good, to be honest with you. He didn't impact me at all. But I did say, if I ever get the opportunity, if I ever do something with my life the way I want to, I'd like to have impact on people because so many, I could sit here for an hour and I'm not kidding. And other than my parents tell you how many people have had impact on my life. And I would like to be somebody like that. So I like to share my story. I have been through the ups and downs and you said roller coaster. It's for sure. And, um, if without that, those, I, what kind of a story would I be if I said, yeah, Liz, I wanted to be, I had this dream August 19th, 1973. And from there, it was just a straight ride up and everything's just great. Well, who can really relate to that? But everyone can relate to the ups and downs, the doing well, then dropping out of sight, not getting the job you want, getting rejected, having people, um, you know, making the, 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 the journey harder than it had to be, people hurting you, people backstabbing you, you know, all those things. I share those stories, including the two short, the, the two stories I shared with you about when I was eight and then in, in July of 99. So, um, you know, you want to be able to strike a chord with somebody because I'll say this, and I'm sure you remember the movie Rudy. Um, and I've, I've met Rudy several times, really good guy. But he said, anybody can be a Rudy. It's hard to be Michael Jordan. It's hard to be Wayne Gretzky. Hard to be Mario Lemieux. Hard to be, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali. But it's not hard to be Rudy. And it's not hard to be Claudio. And I'm not doing that humble stuff. You know, I'm not doing that. I'm just telling you, there's nothing. I mean, yeah, you have to have some talent in what you're going after. Okay. I, I love the piano. Love the piano. But I tried to play it when I was 27, and I told the guy, look, I just want to play a few Barry Manilow songs and Lionel Richie songs. That's it. He, he said, get out of here. He kicked me out. I didn't have the ability. So you have to have some ability. I'm not wanting to say, oh, you can do anything you want in life. Well, maybe not. But if there's something you want to do, and I, let me t say another quick story. There was a girl who wanted to be a country singer. She was pretty good. She tried, she tried, she tried nothing. Then she went to Nashville. That's where country singing is, right? That's the home of it. She didn't make it. And then she started getting a little bit older, right? She said, but I still love this business. Well, wait a minute. I know the business. So why don't I, if I didn't make it as a singer, maybe I can make it as an agent. She made it as an agent, very successful. I, it didn't happen for me as a player. I was very good, but my size hurt. I had a few tryouts and I was injured. Uh, that's another story. But uh, no excuses. It, it didn't happen. Whether excuse happened, reason, good reason, bad reason, it didn't happen. Okay, the result was there. But it happened as a scout. And I turned down opportunities as a coach. Okay, but it still happened. The dream happened. I can checkmark that box. And the box can be checkmarked for you as well. You might not make it as a singer. Maybe you'll make it as a writer. You may not make it as a writer. Maybe you can make it as an accompanist. Um, Barry Manilow, again, he was just a writer. He never dreamed of becoming a singer, but obviously turned out to, to be a singer. Well, so you never 
Never That's know. like the, going to different bases, right? You know, you, you go to base one, you get something there. You go to base two, you get a little bit more there. But you take the experiences that you've learned in life and you say, oh, okay, well, this doesn't work for me, but this does, you know, and that's not giving up on the dream. That's just taking you in a different direction. It's taking you to the left side or the right side instead of going straight down, right down the middle, you know, and that's what life is all about. And I really appreciate you sir, sharing that, Claudio, you know, that it's not easy being us, you know, being authentic and being our true selves. You know, we have a lot of scars and a lot of bumps and a lot of tears in us, but we didn't give up. We didn't, you know, we didn't stay down. We still continued that game. We still pushed through till we got to the home run and we made it. And I, I think that's what's really inspiring about your story, Claudio, is that, you know, and the, the name of your book, I want to get into the book because we are flying by. It is like a, the, the game. We're not getting a break here. We're not getting a timeout. <laughs> we're just batter up, right? Just keep going. So let's talk about the book a little bit, Claudia, because I want to get that book out there because I want people to grab this book uh, and know a little bit more about it. So the book is called, um, where are we? Uh, do, 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 do. I'll, uh, I'm trying to find it. I can't find it in my notes here. Claudia, you want to share the title of the book? <laughs> Read from the heart up, not the neck up, how to create a positive winning culture on the field and in the office. And where did I get the title? My mom used to say, never speak from the neck up, speak from the heart up. In other words, me what you say, care about what you say. They used to say, Roberto Clemente, he couldn't order a cup of coffee without passion, right? So be passionate about it. And, and, and also care for your people. The theme of the book, is uh, Super Bowl winning coach Dick Vermeil, who was a guest on my show, um, one of my shows, uh, he used to say that your players, your people, they won't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And my players know that I care. And um, so I, I, see a, I hear a lot of horror stories between coach and player, CEO and employee, okay? And I wanted to share my stories, how I was able to get these players to want to win for me, how they wanted to play for me, how I've become friends with a lot of those young men that I coached over the years. This is my 41st year of coaching. And I've been in weddings, unfortunately, pallbearers for their parents. I have been just the other uh, couple of weeks ago, two of my players had babies. They sent me pictures. Um, I've been invited to weddings. And it means the world to me. It really does. And, and why did that happen? And it really all stemmed um, one time we were playing a game and it was on my birthday. And this is, I think the story's in the book, but um, the opposing team and the coach were arguing. They were really going at it. Meanwhile, my players brought me a birthday cookie. So I said, why is it? And another thing that's for sure in the story, 1993, I'm at a uh, coaching at a place called Community College of Beaver County, and it was a back and forth game. As a matter of fact, I think this is the first story of the book. And um, we we won the game, and and I'm exhausted as I always am, and and the players are high fiving each other, and then they come in, they high five me. And as I'm in my office after the game, I said, "Why do these players like? Me? Why do they listen to me?" I started off; I was a 23 year old head coach. My players were 17, right? Why, why are they listening to me? But in 93, I was, what, 27 or whatever, 29, whatever I was. But why are they listening to me? And it hit me, two things. Number one, I'm approachable. Number two, I care. They know that I care. And um, that's what the book's about. And it gives a lot of stories about things that happened against me, how not to be a leader, and how to be a leader, from accepting responsibility to mistakes that you made to understanding why somebody maybe messes up and not not browbeating them, but fixing the problem instead of you know hollering at them. What the hell is that going to do? Yeah. You know, and no offense to any coach, but after a game, sometimes a coach will make the player run. Well, what's that going to do? Fix up why he messed up. You know, and nobody wants to be singled out like that. You know, I have two rules: care about the program, whatever's under that umbrella, and don't disrespect me. That's it. Now. Do I just, is it just fun and games and love? No, I'll, I will not tolerate anybody disrespecting me. Can't do it. That's just how I am. And um, so it isn't like I let people go. 
you know, and, and the big thing too from the book is to communicate, 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 talk to people. Uh, these kids, it, it is different now than when I first started. Okay. There's an old saying in sports that the game has passed the coach by. I don't know if I really agree with that. I think that people pass people by. You know, the old days where no water in practice, or if you mess up, you run laps, or if you miss practice, you're benched for three games. Well, you can't do that anymore. And really, maybe you don't have to. Talk to somebody. Yeah. Let Put your guard down. Let's talk. Let's go on the side here. What is it with us? Why are we not getting along? Is it me? Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's both of us. Let's just put things out on the table. So it's it's a lot of stories in the book. I the, the, Yes, coaches have made good remarks of it, but CEOs have contacted me and tell me told me that they re, the book has really helped them. And I even spoke at a pretty well-known company that was having problems with employee and employer relationships. And and I told them how I do things. And and it has to be sincere. Can't, from the heart, not the neck up. Um, so uh, it, it's been, it's had some impact on people and I'm really glad that it has. I'm really glad that you bring that up, you know, because communication is deeply important and that's how I run my platform, right? Good communication. You know, if something happens, life happens, it happens for everybody, you know, have that communication and connect with each other, you know, whether it's day or night in something, you know, you're just like, oh, let's move this up. Like, like this tea time, we had to move it up a little early because you have a game tonight, you know, but if you don't communicate, how do you build, how do you build that relationship and that trust with one another? Right. Uh, if you're just like, nope, this is the way it does. Da, 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 like, you know, like do the runs, do that. Well, you're not, you're not really listening. You're not really looking for a solution. You're just, this is how I'm going to do it. You know, you're setting your ways. Uh, you know, uh, so I'm really glad that you're bringing this up, you know, because we need that conversation out there. And this is what this is, is an open discussion, you know, on how we can better things, how we can find solutions. Maybe the old way was a good way. Maybe the new way isn't as good, you know, but maybe there's a solution. Maybe the, you need a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new and make a new, new book altogether. Uh, so do you have any plans on another book, Claudio? You know, I get teased all the time. Uh, matter of fact, somebody said to me the other day, Claudia, you have a quote or a saying for everything. My my parents, you know, I could go on and on and on all the sayings that they told me, and 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 stories that uh, that help people. They're so called cliches, but they're cliches for a reason. Thought about doing that. Um, somebody talked about an, you know, me writing biography, autobiography, and I might, I might. Um, you know, I still have a little bit of living to do yet. Um, but, um, like I said, I'll be 60, but I still have a lot of dreams that I want to accomplish. Uh, but, um, it's been interesting, you know, I, in, in this room and, and forgive me, Liz, and to your audience, I am not trying to name drop or anything like that. I mentioned a lot of people here today, but, um, in this room, I remember playing with my little cars or playing with something and my mom in the other room, this is in 69. My mom said in Italian, Andretti, Andretti Avinciuto, Andretti won the, the uh, Indy 500. And behind me over here, there's a picture of Mario Andretti, um, so uh, an autographed picture. So I've met just about almost everybody that I wanted to meet. I've become friends with, I, I mentioned Jerry Cooney. In my home office now is my old bedroom. I remember I, watching him on one of his big fights knock out Ken Norton. In May of 81, I believe, in like 54 seconds, I was in that room watching the fight. And here I am over the phone interviewing him on my show. It's like, what am I doing interviewing this guy? Or sometimes I'm in a golf. Uh, I was, I, was, I, was, I get invited to some celebrity golf events. A bunch of us were flying to New Mexico for a golf event. So I'm in this plane with guys that I grew up watching. And some I was friends with, some I wasn't yet. I said, what the heck am I doing with these guys? You know, and it's, or even I mentioned that 79 reunion. Um, I knew a lot of those guys from the 79 Pirates. So they were asked to go in the field for the ceremonies and we were up in the suite, family and friends. So they showed the highlights on the board and I started getting emotional, right? 
So my wife said, what's wrong? I said, number one, Linda, I love that era of baseball in the 70s. Number two, I'm doing what I'm doing, what I always wanted to do. Number three, I'm here at this event, right? And I'm just so grateful and so blessed. And, um, you know, again, my story with my dad, Olindo, my mom, Ida, and now my wife, Linda, my daughter, we named my daughter after my mom, Ida. Um, I've been so, I'm so grateful to have wonderful parents, wonderful wife, wonderful daughter, wonderful friends. Hell, I even had a great pet in Grover. I have another one, a, a cat now, Silver. So I am so lucky. And, um, but I still want more, which is, you know, I, I still want to accomplish more. I still want to, Dan Marino says, you can do more. You can always do more. Uh, Mario Andretti's famous quote, if you think you have everything under control, you're not going fast enough. So I feel there's more left. Um, Greg Norman, the my favorite golfer and favorite businessman, he, they asked them, this guy is a Hall of Fame golfer. He is extremely successful in business, three, four hundred million dollar business. He's worth over there. He's the commissioner or whatever, president of the Live Golf uh, events. And they asked him, you know, you've had all this great stuff. He said, I think I've only accomplished about 30 percent of what I can accomplish. So when I, I, I got introduced at that speaking engagement um, in January and they said, you know, Claudio does this, that and the other thing. And I said, yeah, it's OK, but I can do more and, and I still want to do more. And I really want to impact people's lives like so many have it impacted on. I'm so glad that you're you're putting these names up that you're name dropping because you know it's incredible because who that little eight-year-old boy who went into that field would be where you are today right but all those people you met also have a story they didn't fame overnight as well you know uh and getting these quotes out there is amazing because all the listeners out there can believe in that, that it, it is possible you know and if someone says it's not possible you might have to go a different direction. You might have to strike again. You, you know what I mean? Like you might have to get up to the bat again. And I, I know I'm putting a lot of baseball stuff out there because Miss Liz loves baseball. Like it's one of my favorite sports. And, you know, and I encourage the, like when you go to a baseball game, don't just watch the baseball players, watch the mascots, watch the, uh, and like the, 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 the team, watch the players, watch who's cleaning the field because they all have a story, right? Without all of those people in that field, that, that game wouldn't be possible. And without you being that, that scouting, you know, doing the scouting, Claudio, some of these people would have never had the dreams that they have today. They wouldn't be where they are today because of you. You know, we have to really look at ourselves and say, we've done this. We, we've come this far, but we want more. And it's okay to say you want more and do more because I think it's incredible and really inspiring for all of the listeners out there to want more, to do more, and to serve more. And, and, and that's why I love your tea because it's the top, right? Like we're going right back to the top. You got to be tough, overcome persistence, you know, just keep fighting, keep playing the game. Uh, so do you see, where do you see yourself in the future, Claudia, with, with the baseball game? Like do you, any changes you want to actually make to the game or. Well, as far as career wise, um, again, I, what I'd like to do, uh, is I want to ramp up the speaking engagements. I want to continue to do my shows and ramp those up. And um, I would like to maybe be a consultant of some sort and help people. You know, I have some other businesses and 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 just help. You know, and I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to sit here and say oh, I just want to help. And uh, yeah, you know, I want to provide for my family and and. As they say, keep the wolf away from the door. Money is important, even though people like to say it's not everything. I'm not saying it's everything, but it's a hell of a lot. And um, you know, everybody wants to make a buck. And those are some things that I think I can do to help people and at the same time provide for my family. Uh, baseball, um, I still have passion for it. I would like to uh, just do our Carnegie Mellon University season. We have a fall season. And um, I think we have a shot to win a conference this year. Um, and scouting, just want to continue to grow the Global Scouting Bureau. Uh, then my company, Claudio Relsano Enterprises, what's under that? 
speaking, consulting, training, the book, shows. Just just keep doing more. Just keep improving. Um, keep uh, being more successful. Keep having more impact on people. Keep growing, basically. Keep growing. Uh, Jerry Cooney, again, Jerry said, I want to keep growing. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better businessman. I just want to keep being better. Uh, and, and Chuck Noll, the former Steelers coach, after they won their first, first Super Bowl, right there on the podium, they said, well, you know, what are you going to do next? Well, we're going to try to win next year. This is over. What I did now, it's over with. You know, and uh, you, you want to go to the next win. At the same time, I'm trying to enjoy what I've accomplished. Okay. And, and I do. I do. Uh, and I'm joy and, and working hard now so tomorrow can be good so I can enjoy that. And um, so I want to do all that and, and continue to be, a, a, you know, be a better, a good husband, a better husband. I have a great wife, Linda. Uh, we're going on 26 years. I've known her since 87. Great girl. My daughter, Ida, just graduated from Pitt. My wife just uh, got her master's from Duquesne last year. My daughter graduated from Pitt last year. Now she's going to grad school at Duquesne. She wants to be a school counselor. Um, I always say, if good Lord would have said, what kind of daughter do you want? I could have never written down what she is. She's a wonderful little girl who I, we have so much fun together, all three of us. And um, so I have a, a, a good life, but I'm not going to stop. I, I still want more because if you stop, then sometimes things start to fall, you know, so. Uh, you, know, you just keep at it. And, and so I keep at it. And uh, I'm just very grateful and just want to keep keep doing more, keep doing more. And, that, and that's part of the fun is the chase, as long as I catch that dangling carrot once in a while. But I, I enjoy the chase. I enjoy going after things. I enjoy coming up with new dreams and goals. And, and I want my daughter to be the same way. And she is. Claudio, I want to wrap it up with, uh, we're almost at the end here. I want to wrap it up because you gave me your favorite color is blue. Why blue? You know, um, I don't know. It's just one of those things like a, a gut, it's just something that you like. And I, I like the color blue. Um, there, there's an old, again, forgive me, uh, your audience is going to think, who's this guy I think he is? There's a guy named Chuck Knox. He's from our hometown here in Swickley. He grew up with my dad. He became the head football coach of the Los Angeles Rams. And I was eight, a few weeks before, before, uh, after the, uh, about, it was a little bit before or after. I got to think about that. August 19th. But anyway, when he was coaching the Rams, the most beautiful blue and gold helmets and uniforms, right? So maybe that's where I kind of got it. And the Swickley colors, my hometown, I believe they're blue and gold. So um, even though I'm wearing black right now, uh, I, I do like the blue. I always like asking that question about colors because it tells me a lot about a person, uh, you know, and sometimes it's a memory. Sometimes it's a color. It's a flavor. It's a scent. You know, we all have a reason for that color. So I was just curious about that color blue. Uh, so I want to really thank you, Claudio, for uh, sitting and sharing your story with me today and my audience and listeners out there. Um, what final message do you have for everybody out there today? that your show is very important. Um, everybody needs, you know, you, you have weightlifting to build up your body. We, a lot of us need that mental weightlifting. They need to hear stories to know that they're not the only one who has been rejected. They're not the only one that has goals and dreams that they're not there yet. They're not the only one that has failed. They're not the only one who has succeeded, but want to succeed even more. There's others out there. And your show isn't silly. Your show isn't, you know, we, we got into some deep stuff and, and you've, you asked me great questions. Hopefully I provided some good answers. But your show is important because um, just kind of look at it as vitamins, nutrition, protein, or weights for the mind, for the body, in this case, for the mind and the heart. So. Um, and, and again, anybody out there who has goals and dreams, and I'm not just like everybody else. Oh, yeah, you can do it. Go get them. See you later. No, I've been through it. I've been through hell. My mom passed in my arms. I've had people that I cared for that were not good with me at all. 
I've made mistakes. I've had jobs I wanted I didn't get. I, I'm glad that I didn't get them. I had relationships that failed. I've had uh, I've had financial issues. Thank God we're good now. I've had health. Well, I really haven't had health issues, but um, you know, I, I've been through everything just about. Okay, and my dad went through a lot, and just watching how he got from point A to point B was inspirational to me. But again, there's nothing special about me that I got from point A to point B. Okay, I mentioned Jerry Cooney, who's a wonderful guy. He could one punch knock down a building. But, you know, what did I have? I had that. I was tough, overcame, persistent. And so can you. You know, there's going to be times you want to quit. There's going to be times you're going to say the hell with it. And I did. But I picked myself back, back up. And I used my worst enemy to be my best ally. And there also has to be someone in your life that you don't want to disappoint, even if it's yourself. Even if it's yourself, you don't want to disappoint that person in the mirror. You know, there's going to be people out there. I, for me, I didn't want to disappoint my parents. Now I don't want to disappoint my wife and my daughter. And uh, and you know what? I don't want to disappoint myself either because I know what I'm capable of. So I'm going to keep uh, pushing. And I, I just urge everybody out there to, to keep at it. And to uh, if you get a little bump on you, put a little ice on it, rest up, and go back at it again. And things can happen. They really can. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and sitting with me today and getting all this information out there. You know, it's deeply important that we get all different topics and stories out there, including baseball, because baseball does matter, you know, uh, and we all play a game of life. You know, the roller coaster up and down, uh, you know, strike one, strike two, strike three, but get back up and run for that home base because that's what life is all about. Again, thank you so much, Claudio, for joining me. Thank you for to my listeners and audience for your questions and your support and comments and all that. I truly appreciate it. Without all of you guys, I could not do what I'm doing. And all we're doing is serving real life tea here. We're not serving a beverage. We're serving stories and words and making a difference one cup of tea at a time. I will be back on Thursday with two more incredible guests with two more incredible TEAs as they share their stories and their and, and what they've done. So we have Penelope Holt coming in and she'll be sharing about the Angel Scroll, her book. And then we have returning guests from last year, last season. Bob Burrow will be back in with a Western story. So we have Western coming and we have some scroll, uh, some angel scrolls coming to the table. So again, thank you all for joining me. I will be back on Thursday with two more teas. And again, thank you, Claudia, for joining me and sharing your story with all of my listeners out there. Let's just keep sharing real life stories, guys. It, the stories matter. They make a difference. And tea does make a difference one cup of tea at a time in a different way. Miss Liz style.